All right. Thanks again for making Locked On Nets your first listen of the day. We're available and free on all platforms. Also, this episode is of Locked On Nets is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. We got a packed podcast here. Adam and I are going to break down some of the uh, finer details of the loss to the Bucks. We'll talk about rotations. We'll talk about how the Nets are still kind of a work in progress, which is sometimes not what you want to hear about a team bound for possibly a championship hopes, but that's very much what they look like in the first game against Milwaukee. We're going to go through the rotations, the minutes, who played, who didn't. A lot to break down. But first, the theme music. <laughs> You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast and the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, the Brooklyn Nets every single day rolling through. Now, having begun regular season, I am Doug Norrie, the owner-operator of DFSR.com. If you need some NBA projections for a FanDuel or DraftKings, head on over to DFSR.com. And that is Adam Marmbrecht, in addition to covering the Nets with Reckless Abandon. He's also the host of the One Giant Podcast, where he and his boy Andy Mack are bringing you through the Giants' woeful season. Buddy, how are we doing? It's Wednesday. We're coming off a loss. We've got some Nets basketball to talk about here. I may never recover. I may never recover oh, no. from it all. I'm going to be all right. I'm good, man. Yeah, it's funny. You, we, we talk about like getting out of that first game and the things you want to take away. What we don't get to do sometimes is just hear some of the post-game comments when we get into record, and it's usually all boilerplate stuff, but I do think that we got from Durant and Harden and Steve Nash, everybody basically, it was all the same consensus coming out of that first game of, you know, this is going to be a process, which I think is something for Brooklyn Nets fans. Maybe not what you wanted to hear. You want the the cachet of a big first win against the defending champions, but it kind of seemed like it lined up with what we anticipated coming out of that first loss. Yeah. Like, what are you going to say? Like you can't, there's there. I mean, they were honest about, they played bad. I don't really know another yeah. way to put it. We, we, we talked about it yesterday. They played poorly. The stat line for some of these guys did not reflect the way that the game really went for everybody. We're going to get into some of the uh, rotations that they went through today, who played kind of who didn't some like, sort of curious decisions, but maybe there's a, uh, a plan with this whole thing, but um, yeah, I don't really know. Like, I, I'm not surprised what Kevin Durant you know, sort of talks about it. And he, you know, he had a little bit of a, I guess he had a little bit of a way to look at it that I hadn't really thought about, right? In some of his post game quotes, because you have some of that, those post games, right? Where it's like he talks about what, like, what kind of went wrong on a macro level. And I thought it was pretty honest in a way that. And we talked yesterday about some of this stuff is correctable. And I think that in listening to his postgame com- uh, comments, it did it, it very much that it followed along with what we said yesterday, which was that a lot of this stuff is has to do probably more with just like a relative newness around that this team more than anything else. Yeah, specifically to the game, Durant said, it's one game out of 82 when you look at it that way. Obviously, we were climbing an uphill uh, the whole game after trailing by 19 in the opening quarter. We had good spurts, cut it to five a few times, but we couldn't get over the hump because they had more possessions than us. They kept getting the ball in their hands, so it was a possession game for us. That's on the, the micro of the game itself. But then he went on to say, in so many words, we were a little bit worried about stepping on one another's toes in terms of some of the new players – Millsap and LMA coming back and then, and, and then even the returning guys in in new roles for themselves like Blake Griffin, Nicholas Claxton that we're going to get to later as well. So I think that's the the piece that you highlighted in the last episode of these are correctable things. And I wasn't anticipating Kevin Durant or anybody from the Nets coming out and going, "Yeah, this is uh this is a problem. We got some real issues here." But When you bring in, even though they're veterans, and we talked about that veteran experience, guys that you know you can rely on and are going to give you consistent results, you think, on a night-in, night-out basis, there is still the part where all these guys need to get on the floor together, figure out how they fit and work together, and find that continuity from the starting five into the bench unit, et cetera. So that's, I I think we were on the, you know, nail on the head with that, and Durant and even Harden as well confirmed it in the postgame. 
Yeah, like I, when you look back at this game sort of um, from sort of beginning to end, it, it, it begins to line up with why things looked out of sync, right? Like so, and why these guys might not have known exactly how to deal with each other. This is outside of practice. For the for, for starters, let's, talk, let's just talk about it. For starters, the starters. <laughs> the, they, the way they started the game was a lineup that we have not seen before, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, they obviously Harden, Durant, uh, Joe Harris start. We knew that was going to be the case, but I, but when Steve Nash declined to give the starters at about 90 minutes before the game, because I monitor this stuff all day long with um just like projecting minutes for every player. So I'm very interested besides just rooting for the nets. I'm very interested in what the starters are for every single team as early as possible to start uh, kind of figuring it out. When Nash about 90 minutes before the game tells the media that he's going to decline to give the starting lineup. At that point, I knew we probably weren't getting the Bruce Brown, Blake Griffin that we thought we were going to get as the carryover. Right. And just because I think that would have been an easy thing to say, but, and now he's like just kind of playing coy and they've started to Claxton and Blake Griffin together, which is interesting. And it's just not some I, how much, how much, you know, cohesiveness could a unit like this have? They've never played together like this before, at least in live action. Well, and the other thing was too, because you mentioned Nash and as far as setting the starting lineup, he had also said, I think in the pregame comments was, I'm going to run about 10 guys deep. Somebody's going to be on the outside looking in, going to kind of see how that fleshes itself out. But he also, he gave the indication early on in this season, it's going to be a, as far as nailing down who are, you know, who are, who are going to be your consistent contributors off the bench? What is that second unit going to look like? It was, we'll see. We'll see who kind of rises. And I don't think that's not because Steve Dash doesn't maybe know what he has in any of these individual players, even including a Javon Carter or a Patty Mills that comes first man off the bench in that in that game against the Bucks. But it's more, I don't know how these guys work with one another fully yet. That That's what I don't know yet. So in that regard, when you talk about the starting five and what we saw against the Bucks, I'm not going to put a, a ton of weight into it because I think you're going to see these little tweaks, these little adjustments until Steve Nash gets those samples that says, okay, this guy is very clearly X. This guy is clearly Y. And I mean, we'll use Patty Mills as the example. Is he going to, as you said, go a hundred percent from beyond the arc? Probably not. We'll see, you know, there's, there's some chance, but, but what he does know is there you go. Patty Mills is exactly what we thought we were bringing in. He can probably work independently of who else you put him on the floor with and how those rotations work. Okay. Check that box. But now, as you as you highlighted, Nicholas Claxton, Blake Griffin, LMA, you talk, you know, Millsap. Like, I don't know how these guys all combine together and how they function really well around Kevin Durant or around Harden, and then around some of the other supplemental pieces like a Joe Harris and even even a Javon Carter who got some minutes in this as well. So it's there's a lot of moving parts, and this isn't this isn't you know excuse making territory. I still expect the Nets to win a lot of games early in the year, but I wouldn't be shocked if you saw some clunky play when it comes to especially going up some of the top teams in the league like the Bucks, Yeah, we'll talk about this lineup and sort of how they did actually function together. Um, I think that we're going to probably spend the beginning part of the season doing a lot of look at, like it's not going to look the same every time. I think that seems like it's almost definitely going to be clear. It didn't even line up. We'll get to this a little bit in a little bit too. It didn't even line up from from uh, first half to second half. Usually, right. you see those those kind of rotations maintain some continuity for a game because that's kind of what they have in mind. That even that didn't happen in this game. They went away. They you know they started with one thing, went to the, something else on the first rotation, and then went to something totally different in the second half <laughs> when that when that thing wasn't working. I think I, I'm, I bring that up because I think that's going to be something we see a lot of this season. Is this sort of like you said tinkering? This tinkering of Let's try these two together. Let's try these three guys together. Let's try, you know, what does it look like? The, the, the constants will always be Durant and Harden, you know, if Kyrie ever comes back. And it seems like Joe Harris is his role. And we can talk about him too, but his role um, at least is solidified. Uh, you know, we, we can talk about what that's, you know, bringing to the team right now. But um, in general, I think we're going to see lots of mixing and matching around those rotations and around those it, with the big three, who's playing at the four and five. Well, and by the way, right, because the last thing that we don't need to mention, but just so everyone knows, you also don't have Kyrie Irving, right? And that's the other that's the other wrench into the machine here as well. You brought in all these other complementary pieces, and then you lost one of your three key stars, and that impacts all the rotations as well. So you you all of a sudden go from maybe having an expectation of the backcourt looks like X, and then we start to flex out these minutes, and a couple of different guards come in, and we mix and match. So you at least had probably a, a loose template about how you thought you were going to come into the season. then situation with Kyrie occurs he's not going to be a part of the team and now you start to shuffle it up and 
again, mentioning Patty Mills, if you're going to try to keep certain guys in roles that you feel like you're really going to like them in, positive sample there from him, then what do you jump to? You jump to some Javon Carter minutes? Do you jump to some Joe Harris? You know, we talk about positionless basketball, but effectively being being the second guard in the starting rotation to start that game. These are all the things that I, I highly doubt the Brooklyn Nets were planning on paper to be doing in the course of the offseason and training camp. That's a pretty quick pivot as well to, to throw into the mix of decisions that Steve Nash and this coaching staff are going to have to navigate. Yeah, like I, I hate the barrier, but when Kyrie Irving's your third player, like your third best player, then it kind of sometimes starts to matter less and less around who those last two guys are. <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is one of those things that we uh we you know kind of get you can get spoiled with that we're we're not gonna be spoiled with this year but um that is why those things th these decisions actually along the margins do become a little bit more important all right we'll talk about some of these bigs and what the rotations look like some of the kind of weird stuff the nets did uh, at times during this game with the bucks first this episode of Locked on Nets is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. That's a lot of decades, folks. McDonald's has been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where family and friends can come to connect. Look, McDonald's, you know you the kind of food you're going to get there. It's absolutely delicious. You get free Wi-Fi if you're thinking about going and working there. The coffee, kind of man, coffee underrated at McDonald's as well. Birthday parties, they've been having those there for decades. McDonald's has been serving communities for decades now. It's always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where, like I said, fan, friends and family from the community come together. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. McDonald's, I'm loving it. All right. Speaking of Ronald McDonald. The uh, starting rotation for the Brooklyn Nets, that's the kind of segue that you make <laughs> off of that. When we talk about starting five, obviously we came into this game, we weren't really sure, we thought we were going to get the nod to last season, the Bruce Brown, Blake Griffin lineup. Instead, surprisingly, Nicholas Claxton gets the start. I, I want to get into all the bigs as well, but since he was in the starting rotation, let's start with, let's start with him. It was both encouraging that he got the start, and then... For a guy who loves Nicholas Claxton and wants to see him be successful, I think you got another one of those samples where you just kind of said, right, this is the up and down with a player like this, given his size, given the areas of weakness on the offensive end, even though he's versatile defensively, you know, it's just going to be a mixed bag with him. And even if he's going to develop over the long term, which I think he will, he's not there yet. And this kind of felt like if you're going to try some things, and you're going to see what different looks maybe can give you on the court, why not go with the young kid? Why not see what he's capable of giving you if you put him alongside Blake and Kevin Durant? As you said, first time this unit had played together for the Brooklyn Nets. Did, is that essentially what you took away from Nicholas Claxton, at least in the, you know to kick off the season? Yeah, I mean, like they, he started that last that last tune up game sort of out of nowhere after being effectively buried for the beginning part of the season. Now he had been sick, so that could have been part of it. And so that was this this random thing that had come up um, later was that he had been dealing maybe with the flu, and that could have actually been influencing the lack of uh, time on the court. I'm not exactly sure, but he definitely he was playing with the rookies to start the season. Did not there was no indication that he was going to be the starter until we get to that last preseason tune up, and he starts plays fine enough in that game. And then I would still say surprisingly gets the start here. Now, um, I do think it's because they need to try to develop athleticism. Uh, they, they, they could really use his athleticism on the defensive end. And they um, also, I think, are, are continually motivated to see what they have here with them and whether it's going to work. It's probably better to find out early than late. I, I, that might be the um, the thought process. I also think, too, this particular matchup was done on purpose. I rewatched uh, a good portion of the first half uh, just in just kind of slowing it down uh, over the last uh, or excuse me on um, Wednesday afternoon. And they stuck him at Middleton pretty exclusively. And I think I was in, in thinking about it. I was wondering if that was actually more the plan than anything else is that they didn't want to overload Kevin Durant on Middleton or Giannis for a period for long stretches on the, on the defensive end. They knew they could stick um Claxton on him. They cross matched him because he does not. Middleton obviously did not guard him on the other end. Middleton picked up Durant most of the time when they weren't switching. So I was I was wondering if actually this was very matchup dependent in this case because it was like sometimes you think oh can can Claxton ha hang against Giannis? Well that wasn't what they did here. They still stuck Blake on Giannis as much as they could. Um, but Claxton's primary defensive assignment for a majority of the time that he was on the court was Chris Middleton, which you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. It didn't really work. He still had trouble with him. Uh, um, so I, it wasn't. But I exactly... do like the idea of it, right? Like I do, I, I do oh, like sure. the premise of of saving of saving those reps from from Kevin Durant. And in theory, 
if things are going well offensively and it's clicking, then that that should actually be a plus matchup for you. You know, a positive situation defensively more nights than not when there's those type of players on the other side. And we also had a sample size to say Joe Harris can't do the job, right? We, yes, like, we, yeah. we got a we got a playoff series that said that Joe Harris is not that he cannot defend Chris Middleton. So we already know that's not going to work. So they tried to throw something else in this case, which was the they know that Claxton's super switchable. They want to switch on defense as much as possible if they have the right personnel. Claxton is a guy that can switch into almost any almost any matchup. So that's going to win on that level. They are they tried to stick his length on Middleton to make it so that Middleton couldn't get into the mid range game. It didn't work because Middleton got to the basket a little bit more and he lost them on a bunch of assignments too. So again, uh, I like the idea, if, even if the execution was probably poor. But um, I think that was the thinking, and that's why I actually wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me for this next game if they just didn't do this. Like if 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 they didn't see this matchup as probably helping them to start in Friday's game, we'll talk about that later. Like I wouldn't be shocked if this actually keeps switching. Like and, and is like sort of matchup based, which which would make sense to me. And then we're going to get into the rest of these bigs here and and what could work for them or what didn't work for them against the Bucks. But the last little piece of it, I think, the difficulty with using Claxton in that way is unlike last year, where you have him playing at the five, and then when these switches happen, he ends up picking up a guard. Well, it's a real plus that he can follow those guards to the rim, use his size and length to affect their shot going to the basket. Now, though, when you get him into these other spots at the four ish, let's say. Now, all of a sudden, there's a five that can create the space for Middleton to operate off of that. So I think that's where you're talking about working over underneath screens and, and how effective Nicholas Claxton is in that area of his defensive game can kind of be a balancing act as far as, you know, are you gaining something with him in these matchups? Sure, but you may need to wait and try to build him up to the point where he can fluidly move across those assignments with a little bit more ease so he doesn't lose a guy like Middleton in the lane. Well, and one thing with him too is like yeah. the the thing that absolutely has to happen with him is that he if he's not really, really, really winning the defensive battle, you are falling behind with him because he's bringing so little on offense that he really needs to absolutely crush his defensive his defensive assignments. Because if not, we saw his whole offensive game is like at this point just rolling to the rim. They tried over and over to get it to work. It was you know had diminishing returns over time, right? Like he got completely destroyed by Giannis on a block early in the game. Like he missed a cut. The timing was off on a couple of them. I think sometimes they were Harden's fault, but in general, but he got lost in the sauce setting screens, like kind of got totally, caught in no totally. man land inside the yeah. arc a few times where he was, you know, and, uh, well, I'm not beating up on him for the sake of it to do it, no, but no. he got caught in these weird spots where he was almost effectively in the way of the progress of the play. Yeah. So it just, again, it, it's a work in progress. This whole thing, this is the theme here, by the way, it's a work in progress. Right. Like this is what Kevin Durant was kind of saying. This is, we saw this. I, you don't want a team that we expected to sort of win upwards of 60 games to be called a work in progress. Like that's not exactly the thing you want to hear. This is still a very good team, but it's clear to me now after watching this first game and about, and especially with some of the other stuff we're about to talk about is that they still do not know what exactly that what that is they want to do yep. <laughs> like and it's okay this is why you have the regular season you have 82 games to figure this out they are going to win a lot of games they're simply too talented the bucks are awesome like the bucks are a top five at worst team in basketball like so it's not like you just lost to the orlando magic who want to lose right <laughs> so that's not the right. case here but um but with claxton like i i wouldn't be shocked if like i said that this is maybe the only time we see this or we see something just totally different on friday because that you know, the matchup is just not going to really behoove him. Like he's really not going to be able to do much. Or maybe it's like, Hey, it's Tobias Harris. And like, you know, they want to stick him on there. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like there is some other thing. There's lots of different ways this can go. Um, do we want to get into these other bigs here too? Like, is that, yeah, we can start to touch on it a little bit. Cause there's, I mean, there's, there's plenty here. It's probably going to, we're probably going to go a little bit long in talking about this specific area of the game, because you mentioned Blake Griffin, he goes up against, he takes on the task of Giannis like he did last year. And basically, you know, had his level of effectiveness and no one's going to stop Giannis, but he was the only guy that had any level of effectiveness against Giannis. And this is the part where we get to figuring things out and seeing how it's going to look when you can, focus on Blake for a minute if you want. I think basically, you know, Blake's come back here and he is leaning into that role that he identified for himself last season, right? He's going to do the dirty work. He's going to be willing to be physical. Like that's, that's what he is for this roster. But then when you get to like Millsap and to LMA, I mean, I, to say that I don't have large takeaways is mostly to say like, I almost don't remember them playing. 
Like it was yeah. a non-existent well, performance for the both of them. And I, I, and I'm willing to lean into this is things they have to figure out. But were you surprised by kind of just the lack of functionality for those two players? Because again, these are experienced veteran players that you would have thought could basically step on and give you X, could give you something fairly quantifiable, not dissimilar to what Blake is able to do. Yeah, okay, let's get into that in a second because there, there's a lot to yeah. unpack here with what happened here with Aldridge and Millsap from, uh, again, from just an individual playing level and also from a rotation level. First, do you know what a guy like LeBron James does? This is a guy who you wouldn't mind coming in off the bench here, right? Like we talk, we're about to talk about Millsap and LaMarcus Aldridge. I imagine LeBron James coming in here. You know what gives LeBron James his superpowers? It's pretty easy, folks. It's sleep. King James is into uh, sleep and meditation and calm is the number one app for both of those teams. They've teamed up with LeBron James to help you activate the power of sleep. When it comes to athletes, sometimes you take the focus on the physical fitness. How could you not? These dudes are uh, just, you know, bringing that on a different level, but there's also another side to the game. That's just as important as their mental fitness. Calm is the number one app for sleep and meditation. They've teamed up with LBJ to help you train your mind to become the champion version of yourself. LeBron and Calm know that your mind is unlike any other muscle in your body, but you don't have to be a world champion to learn how to train it. So if you head over to calm.com slash locked on MBA, calm, C A L M.com slash locked on MBA for a limited time, you're going to get 40% off a calm premium subscription. This is too good to be true. Again, you're unlocking mental fitness with this. This is like the biggest no-brainer in the world to go and grab this calm.com 40% uh, off subscription. With calm, you have access to the nature scenes that LeBron loves, like rain on leaves, and so much more like sleep stories, meditation, so you can be ready for any challenges that life throws your way. Again, for a limited time, our listeners can join LeBron James and using calm and get a 40% discount on a calm premium subscription. Calm dot com slash locked on mba unlock content to help you focus ease stress sleep better com dot com locked slash locked on mba that's com dot com slash locked on mba and of course when i think about lebron james and doing some of his endorsement appearances or maybe he's hawking a couple products here and there i think about that guy being cool calm and collected underneath the stress of those and it makes me hope and wish that I could avoid getting nervous and maybe having to deal with some of those sweat issues. That's where sweat block comes into play for you. You don't have to worry about swapping out shirts, worrying that midway through the day, you got to rush home to change something out before a big meeting. All those, all those worries and concerns about not being able to focus on the thing that you know you're capable of doing. Take all that concern and worry off the table. Use sweat block. You apply it the night before, wash it off on the in the morning, and go about your week. It stops excessive sweat for up to seven days days per use. It's doctor created, doctor recommended, and it comes with a dry shirt guarantee. If sweat block doesn't keep you dry, you get your money back. There's nothing to risk, everything to gain and everything to lose in terms of sweat. Know that it's not just for armpits as well, chest, back, feet, hands, use it anywhere. And I mean, anywhere. If you know what I mean, you can go ahead and get over to sweatblock.com and use the promo code locked on to get 20% off. That's promo code locked on on sweatblock.com for 20% off or also get it over on amazon.com or at CVS sweatblock. The thing is, Doug, when we get back into this mix here, so uh, you talk about Aldrich, you talk about Millsap. What are the, let's lean back into the reasons why it doesn't matter what you saw in the first game, but then also what do you think these guys are capable or not going to be capable of bringing to the table in terms of creating that room, like we said, coming into the season, length and strength, a little bit of size, a little bit of muscle. I mean, I didn't have any, you know, misconception that LMA was going to walk in and start bodying up Giannis. It's just, that's just not the matchup that he's built for, but I maybe was a little bit surprised that they didn't use Millsap in a pseudo Blake Griffin role to some more success. Yeah. So the first rotation of the game, well, excuse me, Patty Mills comes in in the first, uh, first rotation for Joe Harris. Uh, and look, I, let me just get this out of the way. Joe Harris was kind of just a zero in this game. There isn't much to talk about. Uh, like I, there's, I'm not just avoiding the Joe Harris topic. It's just like he just didn't do anything kind of good or bad. <laughs> so right, it was just it was just like kind of this Joe Harris game that um like he didn't get that many shots off. The defense was eh, you know okay. So anyway, I just want to get the Joe Harris thoughts out of the way. Like there's just not much. I don't think there's 
it's not Either all that Joe makes his talking. shots or Joe doesn't make his shots. Like that's essentially what Joe Harris is. I know, like we're a fan of him on uh, we're a fan of him. We like him. We like what he does, but that's the essence of what he is and what he brings to the table. So when it, when he doesn't knock down seven triples in a game or whatever, it's basically, yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I feel like there's that element of what about Joe Harris? And you go, the, the, the two more games like this, here. then we have problems. Like two exactly. more games like this. Like we'll do a whole Joe Harris episode for yeah. sure. I, like, I, don't, don't worry about that. Anyway, they, uh, he comes in for Joe Harris. He obviously shoots lights out. Now the second rotation or like that, the, the next line of guys, they bring in Millsap, uh, Marcus Aldridge, and Javon Carter. This lineup was terrible. I don't really know the way to put it. It was, um, it didn't work. Nothing about it worked, uh, except for if it wasn't for Patty Mills draining threes, the plus minus would have looked even worse for some of these guys. Like yeah. it was, they brought kind of nothing on the offensive end. Uh, they brought even less on the defensive end. Like L- Aldridge looks completely out of sorts. Millsap completely bricked the three uh, that they took. Now the the fun. Or, uh, 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 he didn't take a shot. What am I thinking of? Maybe it was Mill. It was someone else. I think Griffin took. Oh, two, maybe it was Mill. It was Millsap right? passed to the Carter and Carter bricked mm-hmm. the three. Anyway, um, it was a little weird that Mill that we never saw Millsap again. Right, like that was the five minutes and that was the end of it. Like that, I found to be very odd that. Um, cause that is just like, is not what you just don't see that. Like Millsap is actually not the kind of guy that you're s- kind of seeing what you have at this point. This guy is a long-term veteran. Like they can, should kind of know the fact that that was five minutes. I mean, I've not heard anything about an injury at this point. I maybe we'll hear something after practice tomorrow that there was some kind of injury. Cause it's very weird that he only played five minutes and that was the end of him for the game. Right. Yeah. That he did, that they did not do that rotation again in the second half and try it out. Cause usually no matter what, like most, most coaches, or have pretty steady hands around this. If the plan was to do this to start the game and me, yeah, it didn't work for five minutes. Usually you go back for at least another five minutes and try it out again. Like that was the plan ahead of time to scrap it that quickly. I, like I said, I'm not sure if we're missing it on Millsap. And then the Aldridge thing just looked like a guy who hadn't played in a year or whatever it is, like six months, six months yeah, now, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it was just, it, it was just, it was, the timing was weird. Um, The defense was, was pretty bad. Like it was just, Again, I don't really know another way to put it. It just didn't look good at all. I, I think I, my hope is it gets better, but it's excuse me. You cannot look at this first game and take away. There's, there weren't a lot of good takeaways from these minutes that they had yeah. together as an ultra sort of. I'm going to call this like a big unit in the sense that they're like it's a pretty thick unit. It's still not overly tall like to play these guys at the five. One of these guys at the five, but um. I don't think of it as a small lineup necessarily because I, I saw some people comment on it was a small lineup and I was like, oh, did they mean that one? Because I don't think of that as small, but yeah, it's mostly because it's small probably from a height size, but not from a you know a width size. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, there's just nothing nothing about it works. I, I I don't really know what else to say except that I'm mostly just weirded out by that that was the end of it for Millsap, right? Yeah, like that, like that, you think that, you that I found to be weird. Ran with it a little bit longer, obviously. I, again, I'll see how it flushes itself out. And in that regard, like I'm willing to push the pause on the big conversation because there wasn't really a lot to take away from it. And to your point, the LMA piece of it, I, I, I'm going to give him as as much of a grace period as anybody because he's coming back out of retirement and conditioning and just finding a rhythm, all of those things. And again, this does feel like when you go up against a team like the Bucks, like they're going to make a lot of guys, if they're not quite in sync or in rhythm, they're going to make them look a little bit bad. The other thing that I will, that I do want to get to though, out of this game is you said Javon Carter, right? For all of his scrappiness, he's clearly undersized. Do you think that, and there's a couple other thoughts around the rest of this rotation, just the team in general, but do you think that the Javon Carter minutes, which he ended up running, what, nine, what do you run? 19 minutes. I mean, 19 minutes didn't take a lot of shots, et cetera, et cetera, but we didn't get any really Bruce Brown in this game, right? He came in at the yeah. back end for the garbage time minutes. Do you, would you say that this is the Steve Nash coaching staff saying, now that we don't have Kyrie, Let's take a look at who we think might pair well. We mentioned just in terms of Joe Harris, moving him to into that kind of backcourt role when you talk about the starting five and you add Claxton into the mix there. Even if they ran Millsap in instead, even if they ran in LMA, right, you're still going to be pushing Harris down in that kind of hierarchy of positions. Were they trying to take a dart throw here to see can Javon Carter be a little bit of that role before we go to Bruce Brown and say, Obviously, we look at you as being versatile. We can use you in a lot of different ways, but we also want to know what we have in Carter because to me, you know, Bruce Brown just seems like the obvious one to put in there for all the reasons I just said. He he can do a lot of things on both ends of the floor and you have a really big sample size on him. I was, I don't want to say shocked, but but I I was, I was pretty shocked that, that Bruce Brown was a virtual DNP in this game, especially when you're talking about giving 19 minutes to a guy like Carter. 
Okay, so I, I actually wasn't surprised by the Carter thing at all. He played really well in the preseason. I think when they take Harden off the court, and that's basically who he came in for, uh, they just need another ball handler in addition to like whatever you think Patty Mills is. And I mm-hmm. think he does represent that at that point. Again, this is supposed to be Kyrie. This is another one of these cascading sort of issues here, like the, of what happens when you go from Kyrie Irving down to Javon Carter, right? So like, um, but they do need that secondary. They need like even a primary ball handler at that point. So I wasn't actually that surprised. I actually see Carter and Bruce Brown as, as separate entities. Like where I was worried about Bruce Brown, the second that Bruce Brown doesn't start, it's like a bad sign for him because it's it is hard to sort of bring him in and he needs to be paired with just the right kind of people like he needs to be paired with a guy like Harden who can find him like in, in the high screen like what or like or excuse me uh, at the foul line and if he's gonna be able to like move to the basket if he's not playing with that kind of guy it's gonna be it's already gonna be kind of hard from him they have so many big guys that kind of are in the way of what he did really well now that this was kind of a concern also going forward was that where does he fit? Because he actually doesn't really fit with any of these bigs either because none of them can really stretch the court. Like they can move out and they're okay, but they're not so dangerous that, that defenses really need to respect it. Mm. So I see Carter and Brown as pretty separate kind of guys at this point. So I'm – okay, so two things. One, I'm not shocked. I, I am still a little surprised that Bruce Brown didn't play a lot. Like that was still That's what I mean. the minute I'm, with, yeah, I mean, I'm with you, but it's not because I guess what I'm saying is I, I'm I'm with you, but it's not because of Javon Carter. Like I just not see one them to one. As, yeah, those are like mutually exclusive things. Like they're just they they just don't really one to one do the same things as each other. I think we will continue to see Carter play more. I think they do need that, especially. I think we'll actually see some maybe more stuff with him paired with Harden too, like to try to get his defense to be the work point of attack. And so um, I wouldn't be shocked to see that, but. I think we're going to see like this continue to move back and forth, but I, I would be actually, I would be a little concerned about the Bruce Brown thing going forward about his time. If he wasn't going to find himself in here and they are going to play matchups, it could get exceedingly weird about where they think a good matchup for him is. And cause he's not going to bring scoring. Right. And he's go- He's going to bring defense. He, it's going to be hard to pair him with some of these other bigs. I think, a decent amount because you just have what of all kinds of, sp- unless he can shoot corner threes, but he hasn't really shown he can really do that yet. And so I yeah, just for think some it's reason, a him with like LMA weird. makes a little bit of sense to me. Like that would be, yeah. Like that one's probably the closest. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe even Millsap. I mean, Millsap can stretch the court too. It's like the, uh, yeah. there's, there's a role for him um, for sure. Like, look, we saw him start with Blake last year. It can happen. They're just, it's just a crowded house right now. And if you think about him as a big, cause that's actually what he played as last year, even though he's a smaller guy, you actually need to put him in that group really to say like, he's in that he's more in the group with Aldridge and Millsap and Blake and Claxton more to me, more than he's in the group of Patty Mills, Javon Carter and the guards. Like that's more, that's kind of where I, I see the separation more. And that's and, and and to be fair, maybe that that's the reality that coming into the season, right? When you brought these other guys in, I had said we had talked about in the offseason, right? Bruce Brown moving back to that kind of Detroit role where he was on ball a bit more. That's kind of where I just shifted my mindset with him. Yeah. And and if the Nets don't look at him that way, then it does change it. Then all of a sudden you go, ah, you're still kind of our pseudo big, and and maybe that makes it a lot more difficult to, for you to find minutes, even if we don't have Kyrie. Because again, if you're not going to be a ball handler, it changes some things. And the last little footnote I'll say to keep an eye on is not that Kyrie's a big guy either, but Javon Carter is an undersized, you know, he's undersized. So is Bruce Brown, even if he's out there, wherever you're going to stick him. Patty Mills is not a big guy either. Like the backcourt after James Harden in terms of presence and physicality and all those things, it's a pretty, it's a pretty small kind of group in room. So, so pairing those combinations now does become interesting too, because you're defensively, even if you're good, I think they mentioned in the broadcast, Javon Carter did some really nice things defensively and also not big enough on those switches to, you know, win those matchups or really affect the shot. Some of them were on ones where he was, he was up against, uh, against Middleton and you don't expect it, but that's just something to, to see how those wrinkles get ironed out here, because there's going to be a lot of opportunities for, for the other team. When you talk about uh, same thing, I don't think it's a small lineup. It's a thick lineup. You hope they can be physical, but there's going to be size advantages like there was last year, not as bad, but there's still going to be size advantages for a lot of, of opponents on a night in night out basis and how effective these, these players can be on both ends of the floor. That's where it becomes a little indicative. So whether it is Javon Carter, again, isolating them, not one-to-one, but if Carter can't also be effective on the offensive end, whether shooting or facilitating, then I think you, you do have to go to the Bruce Brown opportunity and see what he could give you one game. And I'm sure we're going to see some different things here, but it'll be interesting to watch. It'll be, 
how the mighty fall, right? We talk about from year to year to year. Bruce Brown meant everything to this team last year, and maybe he does not mean nearly as much depending on how they look going forward. Yeah, for sure. And again, I think we're just going to be a game by game thing. I think we're going to probably have a lot of different takeaways after this Philly game because that's just a total. This is a totally different matchup against Philly. Like this is just we'll we'll preview it a little bit more tomorrow. But what the just sort of fundamental differences are between Philly and Milwaukee, the obvious one is Embiid. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more for tomorrow's episode as we preview the Philadelphia 76ers game with the Nets on Friday. In the meantime, make sure, thanks again for making it locked on at your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. All these episodes and more going up over on YouTube. The link for our YouTube channel will be in the show notes. Make sure you subscribe. Locked on Nets over on YouTube. And as they say, read a short story every day. By the end of the week, you would have read volumes of stories. That's from Lilayla Gifty Akita. Oh, one of the all-time great poets. I feel like you might have screwed that name up. Okay, we'll be back again tomorrow. (laughs) Check the show notes on that. Everyone check the show notes, guys. Don't do things on the fly. Really prepare for the show. You know what I mean? Uh, Out with a whimper, not a bang here. Okay, we'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.